All right. Well, I think I think we got everybody all loaded in. So I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and get us get us rolling. All right. Well, so welcome to the Buffalo History Museum's webinar series. Uh, we have a very special Buffalo Braves program for you tonight. Um, but first, I would like to uh, take a moment to thank our members uh, for all of your support. Uh, without you, we can't. We wouldn't be able to continue our lecture series online, and so I'd like to thank you for that. Um, and if you're not a member, I'd like to. I'm going to drop a little um, uh, link to where you can sign up if you're interested. But so, anyways, just a just a shout out to our membership. Also, I'd like to announce that the Buffalo History Museum podcast is available. Uh, definitely, be sure to check that out on any of your podcast apps. You can check out all kinds of stories about local history and uh, they're quite fun. So, and then, so as far as the format is concerned, um, we'll wait for the Q&A at the end. So if you have questions along the way, I'll try to catch them myself. I'll be writing them down. Just um, know that we can't get to, if there's a lot of questions, we won't be able to get to everything. So, um, but, but we'll try our best. Uh, and I'll try my best to catch all the questions. <laughs> and then finally, for those of you, if you're having audio or video problems, we're gonna be recording the webinar and it'll be available later. I'll send it out to everybody who's registered as well as it'll be available on YouTube. So um, we'll be able to share this as well later on down the road. Um, so uh, that being said, tonight's program celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Buffalo Braves. Uh, one thing I would like to mention is that if you go visit the museum now in our rotating display case in icons, we have a lot of really great items for you to take a look at that are Braves oriented. So, so come check it out. Admission is free. Um, but anyways, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator and also special guest, Bud Bailey. Bud Bailey has been involved in almost every aspect of local sports scene for the last 43 years. He worked for WBER Radio, the Buffalo Savers Public Relations Department, and the Buffalo News during that time. In that span, he covered virtually every aspect of the area's sports world, from high schools to Bills to Sabres and everything in between. Along the way, Bud served as a play-by-play -play announcer for the Bisons, an analyst for the Stallions, and a talk show host. He won the National Lacrosse League's Tom Borelli Award as the Media Personality of the Year in 2011 and was a finalist for that same award in 2017. And he's written 12 books and he also wrote a history of the Buffalo Braves. So, Bud, I'll hand it over to you. I did all that. Wow, I'm, I must be old. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, hello, everyone. I brought, bought a new shirt just for the occasion, a Buffalo Braves shirt. They're still making them, maybe illegally, but it's a nice touch. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the Braves' first game tonight. That was a 107-92 win over the Cleveland Cavaliers. Coach Dolph Shea sent out a starting lineup that night of Dick Garrett, Herm Gilliam, Donnie May, John Hummer, and Nate Bowman. They had 24 points in 35 minutes, setting a career high in scoring, of course. Garrett had 20, including the first basket in franchise history. Bingo Smith had 21 for the Cavs. Now, 14 players took part in that opening game for Buffalo. Expansion teams are allowed to carry 15 players until December 1st when the limit was reduced to 12. I did not know that. Cleveland, Buffalo, and Portland all came in together. Now, here's today's fact about the Braves I've never seen anywhere. After the win tonight, the team would not be above 500 again until October 28, 1973. That's when a 112-100 win over the famous Kansas City Omaha Kings, one of the ugliest names in NBA history put the Braves at five and four. So we're gonna do a little celebrating tonight by talking about the history of the team. And I can think of no one better than our two guests to look back. The first is Milt Northrup, who covered the Braves for the Buffalo Evening News, when it was the Buffalo Evening News throughout the team's existence. Now, I worked across a desk from Milt at the news for many years, and he remains the only person I know with John Hummer's email address. <laughs> So, Milt, take a virtual bow. Thank you for coming. All right. And the other panelist is Tim. Tim, He's got his 1970-71 yearbook for reference. And I've got my program from a Braves game in 1970-71 here. So we're prepared for that sort of ledger. The other, other panelist is Tim Wendell. Now, we met way back 
way, way back during the 1975-76 school year when we were both at Syracuse University when he was a lowly sophomore and I was a junior. But I never knew he was a big Braves fan until he started work on his book, Buffalo Home of the Braves. Tim, point to the book, get the plug in, nicely done. <laughs> now Tim's written about a dozen other books and I think I have them all, they're all good, but uh, the Braves book might be my favorite, Tim. Mm. So for what it's worth, I'm the host of the speaker series of the History Museum that's sponsored by the Western New York chapter of Mensa. And I also have a blog that's the a relatively condensed version of the history of the Buffalo Braves. It is at uh, Buffalo Braves, one word, dot blogspot dot com. And let's see here. I'm wondering if I can set that up and I bet you I can't. So <laughs> in any event, go there and, and uh, see, take a look at it. We've got uh, plenty of uh, information there for you. So I want to talk about, fittingly enough, the Braves' first game. And I'll, I'll go through both of you to talk about if you remember the first Braves game you ever attended. And I, I mean, I've got a pretty good story about the first one I did, which was December 1st, actually. So, Milt, did you get to cover the first game in uh, 1970? Yes, I did. So I did. And, uh, like? Well, first of all, the, 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 start, the, the evening started with a, with a, with a gala party at the um, – Hotel Statler Hilton Ballroom, and I showed a little while ago. We one of the, the gift they gave us was a uh, was a pay, uh, letter opener. <laughs> yeah. Mine's falling apart. Here's the here's the um, here's the insert on it, and I still have it sitting on my desk. I haven't opened any letters with it because nobody writes letters anymore anyway. <laughs> you can't. I also have a. I have the media guy from the first year, but the most interesting page I've found right now, it's funny how you, how you think approach changes as you go, but here's a picture of the uh, media page of uh, the local media covering the Braves. Mike Canale of the car, Charlie Bailey, Jim Baker, Al Bruce, UPI, Charlie Young was my boss of the Buffalo News, Steve Weller, the great Steve Weller, one of my best, my, my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, myself, Marv Pike was the AP guy, uh, Van Miller, of course, Stan Barron, Mike Nolan, Rick Azar, he's a baby there, Jimmy Thompson from WJJL, Ray Hemke is probably better known for his bowling show on radio, Bob Lowe, and then John Hoy of the Lockport Union Sun and Journal. That was a, that was the lineup of uh, media covering the Braves that first year. Uh, left out there, who was a big fan of the Braves, was Phil Renallo. Who was a great Phil Rennell, who loved the Braves. And the Sabre was building. Phil was not wild about the Sabres when everybody in town loved the Sabres. And he, Phil, Phil favored the Braves, and he, he did all the way through. And I had many a, many a beer with him and his wife, Dottie, at the Oil Club after games, complaining about substitutions and how come Randy's not playing more and stuff like that. <laughs> Now, Tim, in, in your book, of course, Phil Ranallo is a, a prominent player. Uh, in, in a it's tribute huge. He's um, got a lot of columns from those days. Yeah. Well, I, I went to Braves games growing up in Lockport, but one of the things that was great was when I worked at the Courier was I had the desk right across from Phil. And Milt's absolutely right. Phil loved the Braves. And, in fact, one of the best things, you know, I miss this sometimes in newspaper land is you'd be waiting for like the last box score or something or the last couple from the West Coast during the, you know, during the summer. And you'd be waiting and it was me and Tim Murray and we would just sit there and listen to Phil talk about the heydays of uh, sports in Buffalo. And a lot of it was the Braves. And I guess Phil got thrown out of a game one time for protesting a ref's call. And, and I think in some ways he, um, he was ahead of his time a lot because I think he was savvy enough that when the Braves did leave town, uh, one of the columns we have in Buffalo, home of the Braves is, and I think it was just definitive and the fact he wrote it on deadline, I think was amazing, was pretty much if Buffalo wants an NBA team, they've got to fight to hang on to this one. And they may lose it, but if they don't fight, they're never gonna get another one. And I think he was absolutely dead on with that. Now, do you remember your first Braves game in person? I think it was the second season. It was kind of a blur. And actually, the guy who uh, 
got me into going to more Braves game, believe it or not, was John Murphy. John was a huge Braves fan. He and I were at Syracuse together, you know, before I met you. And uh, but it was funny because I wouldn't see John that much at, at, on campus. In fact, I sometimes tease him, how many classes did you really go to? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I would see him around back home in Lockport and he would say, hey, we, we got to go to the Braves. And we started going. And then obviously the team took off and what a show. Whatever happened to John Murphy anyways? What's he up to? <laughs> I don't know. I've lost track of him. <laughs> well, funny story with mine. The first game I went to, I had to look it up to make sure, but December 1st, 1970. My father and I go, Braves are playing the Celtics. And my father grew up as a Celtic fan because he grew up near Boston and, and some of that transferred. And of course, the 60s was a pretty good decade to root for the Celtics. So they came in and, and we're rooting for the Celtics. We, we get to the front door and somebody comes up and sells us two tickets below face value. Ooh. And my father's like, gee, odd scalpers they have here in Buffalo. Get six hour tickets for three dollars. That's really unusual. But so we go in, sit down in the blues, um, probably fairly even with a basket along the co center court. And we're sitting next to two Celtics fans, one of whom is Guy and the other's a date. And the guy is pretty well intoxicated mm. and is rooting for the Celtics loudly throughout the evening. So we're kind of applauding a little bit for the Celtics, but of course everybody thinks we all came together and I want to just <laughs> dive right under the seat. So at halftime, I remember Emmett Bryant finished with 14 points in the first half, and John Havlicek had four. And this guy next to me couldn't figure out why the Celtics protected Havlicek in the expansion draft and let a great player like Emmett Bryant go. <laughs> and it's like, this is going to be the longest basketball night of my life. And it was pretty close. Now, I looked it up, and uh, Havlicek wound up at 24 points, and, and so did Bryant, but JoJo White at 37, and the Braves lost 117 to 116 in overtime, and that was one of the first games, and you know this, Milt, the Celtics always beat the Braves. I don't know how many years it was until they finally beat it, probably. I think it was 22 in a row, I think. Something ridiculous, but yeah. uh, it was a very one-sided part of the rivalry, so... Uh, I learned to start rooting for the Braves after that because it was really safer for my well-being. Well, I was just looking at my record book here from uh, last season, and I kept a uh, box score on the officials. And I said, I wonder who made the last bad call <laughs> against the Braves at Boston Garden on April 8th in 1978. And I looked it up and I forgot it already. But I believe it was... <laughs> I don't know it was that was funny. I wanted to see. I thought the last the last bad call was made that week by <laughs> by, uh, by Richie Powers, but not that he was uh, on that game. Uh, he was on that game. Daryl Garrison. Daryl Garrison. <laughs> well, Garrison was about four, he he made his last call against uh, the Braves against Detroit that year. It was not about a week before the season ended. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I saw a name of an official. I don't remember. I don't remember a guy named Milt Cooper was an official. A guy named Milt, I would remember. You know, I, it was uh, everybody, uh, Rooney and um, Paul Mahalik and uh, J John Bannock. And there were guys that came in and out of the league. Cause some guys, some of the officials jumped to the ABA and then they came back to the NBA when the merger came. Right. But that, those guys were – But I remember Phil got thrown out of a game. I got thrown out of a game over in Rochester by Manny Sokol. <laughs> and it, it was – Braves were playing Portland in Rochester that day. And, and I – and he came over to the scorer's table where we were sitting. He's saying, yeah, put charging number three. And I go, why don't you call it the other way? He's, he tossed me <laughs> he tossed me off the press table. I had a seat with no back. I ended up in the first row. First row of the, of the fans, we have a nice, comfortable seat. So, Sokol came back there. He said, "You can go back. You can go back." I said, "No, I'm more comfortable here. I stayed in. I stayed in with the fans." But um, I remember Rudy Mars Rudy Marsky got thrown out by, by um, somebody one night, and uh, in fact, Rudy would have been a good, a good somebody to talk to about this uh, round table. He had a lot of great stories. Some of them, some of them were true. Yeah, some were true.
now one of the odd things about the Braves was the Sabres already came in in December of 69 when the franchise was awarded. The Braves got a franchise six weeks later and there was no ownership. And it was eventual, eventually, uh, it was assigned to an investment firm, but that didn't really sound too interested in running the team. But that problem, it seemed like the Braves were always playing catch up to the Sabres and everything. I, I could probably argue that it started there. Well, I remember when the Braves franchise was awarded, I was on a plane going to Evansville, Indiana with the Buff State uh, basketball team. And that's when I picked up the morning paper. We got on a plane and there's a courier and there's a story about the, about the, the franchise being awarded to Buffalo. And nobody seemed to, nobody seemed to want it. <laughs> they, wanted, they, they wanted a hockey team because they had come so close to the original uh, NHL expansion and then were kind of deprived of kind of screwed out of it by that, if you want the truth. And, um, but uh, that was, and they, that was probably in early, early to mid-March. And, um, but it was a goofy thing. The, 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 the Newberger Lobe, a New York investment house, had the franchise, and it was their intentions to, to broker it to local interest and, and make some money in, on the deal. And they had finally had a, they had trouble because they had two local groups competing for it, and neither one of them neither one of them came up with a lot of money. And that's what I finally Paul, actually Paul Snyder was like a Tom Galasano stepped in and and bought the franchise just a few just a few days before the season was supposed to start. One day, right? I, 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 the week before, Friday night before the season started, I was at a football smoker at UB homecoming. And, and and a rumor was going around room that a, that a guy at the at the smoker, Paul Snyder, was a football old UB football player, was going to buy the team. I had never heard of the man, and um, sure enough, uh, the next two days later, I went to a game up in Niagara. The, the Braves played their final preseason game against the Philadelphia 76ers, coached by a guy named uh, Ramsey, and um, there was a you know, a guy sitting with his wife and his young kids in the stands, and that was Paul Snyder. And that was the first my my first experience with him. Now, right. Tim, the, the Braves did pretty well for a startup because they got, they got Eddie Donovan as a GM who the cliche was Eddie Donovan built the Knicks because the Knicks were the defending world champions in 70. And Dolph Shays, who uh, was one of the all-time great players and then uh, coached Will, Will Chamberlain as much as anybody did at Philadelphia for a while. And uh, here they are together. It, was, it, it seemed like they had the chance to be a pretty good start in that standpoint. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Bud, and I think it's it's too bad that Donovan leaves after being named Executive of the Year in 73-74, because I always felt that, uh, as Milt was pointing out, um, Paul Snyder certainly had his ups and downs as an owner. If, they, if the Braves hadn't won that exhibition game he was at, I bet you Snyder wouldn't have maybe bought the team. He told me he, was, he remembers being so excited because his kids were so excited because they won. Um, but in some ways, you know, the Braves always remind me of how patience is important in management at some point in time. Kind of the early years of the Braves almost remind me at times of the early years of Steinbrenner, maybe running the Yankees or something. Everything's, you know, knee jerk. Everything's being done for headlines, etc. And at some point, you've got to trust your basketball people and you got to sit tight with what you've got. And, um, you know, we'll probably get into it, but the great front line they could have had they had for like two games in 76 77 you know there's certain moments you just want to go stop you know, <laughs> hang on to what you got it's really good whether it's dr jacket coach whether it's bob mcadoo whether it's whoever and i think in some ways this is a little bit of the training wheels of an owner not being involved in sports before this well, the thing that upset me the most in that first year, Bud mentioned that game with Boston. It was a great game that night. We almost beat Boston. We did not really think at the time how hard it was going to be to beat Boston. But the next game was against the Knicks on a Friday night, and the and the Braves upset the Knicks, who were defending champions. And then the next – a week or so later, they played the Lakers there, and they won the game on a, on a basket by George Wilson – this was a great Lakers team. This was Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, Jim McMillan was a rookie, uh, Happy Harrison. Yeah, it was a really a great team. And uh, the next day, what was the lead story in the career? 
a story about Snyder wanting to move the team at Toronto. Yeah. It, it was just the most historic month in the, in the team's young history. And everybody saw about going to Toronto or playing half the games in Toronto. Nothing could kill it. Enthusiasm. Uh, somebody's trying to sell season tickets fast. And I, I, I thought that was the most unfortunate timing of, any, of anything he could have done. It was take, take the story away from the team against winning against what was going to be a championship team. It was the, that was the, the – um, core of what became the, the record-setting team a couple, two years later. Right. Now, one thing we should say about the first year, uh, there's a lot of what-ifs that go with the Braves, but one of them was their first draft choice, which was John Hummer, 6'9 forward from Princeton, good defensive player, uh, maybe a step slow, but uh, – and everybody in the NBA passed on a guy who played up in Niagara, Calvin Murphy, who uh, went on to having a pretty good career. Now, you can't – I guess fault the Braves too much for passing on Murphy because everybody thought he was too short to play in the NBA. But well, everybody thought he was going to go to the Harlem Globetrotters too. That was that was they were trying to sign him, and then the ABA was around too in that time. So, do, do the Braves get off to a better chance in terms of uh, the fans and interest if if Murphy show, walks through the door, or does it matter? I don't know. I mean, by then Murphy had been around here here four years, so he wasn't he wasn't the novelty that he was his um, he was his sophomore year at Niagara when he was he scored fifty a game for a while, but um, and was out. Um, he would have been the greatest scorer in college basketball history up to that time. But it wasn't for a guy named Maravich who was who was coming along at the same time, and then Johnny Newman just a couple years later. Right. But uh, I remember, I remember Murphy. I I covered high school ball in Connecticut with Murphy. I used to see the box scorer from from Fairfield County, Norwalk High, guy named Murphy. I, I'm picturing an Irish. I'm picturing a redheaded Irish kid or something. I don't know. I don't know who he was. And then I, I finally I saw him. I saw him play in the championship championship game at the Fieldhouse and at Stores the next year. And then the next year after that, he he led his team to a championship in at Central Connecticut State. He did everything. He rebounded, he passed, he brought the ball up, played defense, he was the whole team, and he, he made some of the most incredible shots for, um, you know, at full speed. He was just unbelievable. And he twirled yeah. the batons at halftime. What's that? Calvin Murphy used to twirl the baton at halftime. Did it Bills yeah. games? That's the Bills games, yeah. A friend, of he, my, you know. a friend of my parents saw Calvin play junior high ball in Connecticut and said, the auditorium was packed to see a junior high kid because they'd never seen anybody like him. I think there was one silver lining with the whole Murphy thing, Bud and Milt. Um, I think they should have drafted Murphy. I mean, that's 2020 hindsight. Yeah. But I think they felt so chagrined, the franchise did, that they decided, well, we got to show some love to a local hero the next time we get a chance. And hence, Randy Smith comes on board and uh, becomes, I think, you know, arguably the face of the franchise over the long term. And so I, I'm not sure if they would have drafted Randy, potentially if they had had Murphy ahead of time, because I think they felt so much criticism. Well, <laughs> they drafted him in the seventh round. It wasn't like they fell in love with him. They, <laughs> they, they, had, they, had, they, they had overlooked the fact that he played division, the university, the college division basketball. There was no division three at that time. But I, don't, I, I, I always used to kid Joe, the great Joe Nyland is a good guy. He was quoted once – were quote, allegedly quoted as saying that Randy couldn't play in the little three. <laughs> and I used to remind him of that all the time, just to give him, just to give him a hard time. I didn't but, realize that until Bob Ryan from the Boston Globe pointed this out, Randy was drafted the year before by the Pistons. I have no idea, you know, what his eligibility status, but obviously they, they didn't sign him and he went back into the player pool. I don't know if he, like, had I may have forgot to tell him. What? <laughs> They maybe forgot to tell him. Yeah, maybe didn't, didn't bother calling a 14th round draft choice or something. The other guy the Braves took uh, in the second round, they took a few interesting picks, but Elmore Smith was one, third overall from Kentucky State when uh, some of the historically black colleges and universities were still supplying great African American players to the system. That was, the SEC wasn't grabbing them normally, but Elmore, I. I, I think he's probably the most underrated Brave of all because some astounding rebounding numbers back then and could score some and uh, quite a specimen at seven feet, obviously. He had, he had huge hands. And uh, Jim, Jim Baker, the courier, wrote uh, one time that Elmore had bad hands because he was fumbling passes. And, 
as Belmore supposedly said, I'm going to wrap these bad hands around your throat. <laughs> <laughs> right. And some of us are rooting for him to do it. <laughs> and they also got arguably one of the great streak shooters of all time that draft was Freddie Hilton, the second round pick from Grambling. Because he would make like five in a row from 30 feet, literally, and then and then miss the odd the next night. I, I don't think I've ever seen a player quite like him. Milt, do you remember? Oh, I, I, remember the, I remember the Knicks come up for a Friday night game, and the game was televised back to New York. And Fred, Freddie, I think he had about 20 points. He had a great night. And he came he came down the court one time, dribbled to the top of the circle, look left, look right, never looked in the basket, threw up a shot that went in. And all those, all those knowledgeable New York Knicks fans thought that they were seeing the next, uh, the next Bob Cousy. <laughs> and and Freddie just couldn't, um, he couldn't sustain that. But he, he um, retired to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and became a very successful insurance man. He, you know, I honors what they give out the insurance industry. Million, million or stuff like that. He won a lot of them. He was probably the biggest, one of the best sellers of insurance in in in, in Baton Rouge, and he, and he was a good guy. But um, I I I think he just he couldn't discipline his game enough to uh, to make it in the NBA. And one memory, I, one memory I have of that second year. I don't know how we got good seats once, but it's opening night, and the Braves were absolutely clobbered by somebody. And I was low enough that I saw Paul Snyder walk out of his seat, past me on the court, into the locker room, looking like a human volcano ready to explode. <laughs> and sure enough, Dolph Shays was fired that night. And it's kind of like, yeah. as we said before, well, this is going to be an interesting ride. <laughs> well, he, he was really embarrassed. They opened the season. They had high hopes. They had Helmore. Um, and they got beat by about 34 points. It was he was, I guess he was, he was, he was embarrassed for his team. And too bad, because Dolph, Dolph was a, Dolph was a great guy. And I, last time I saw him before he died was at the Hall of Fame. I used to see him at the Hall of Fame when I went there for instructions. And just, just a, just a friendly, you know, you think of a hard bitten New Yorker. He was just, he could have grown up an Idaho. He was just a mellow, mellow guy. You know, it was, it was unbelievable. <laughs> guy who went to school in the Bronx, so. And played uh, played at NYU when he was a 16 year old kid. Wow! And his, and his son went to uh, Syracuse, Dan, who had a what was it, about a 16 year NBA career. Yeah, yeah. He had a long NBA career. Good career forever. Yeah. So yep, the great guy. Yeah, yeah, golf golf lived and, on Berryman Drive and uh, and Snyder. Yeah, <laughs> Which one? The, uh, in year three, the '72 draft comes along, and Portland, for whatever reason, takes Larue Martin. And I'm sure the Trailblazers would like that one back. And number two is Buffalo and takes a guy named Bob McAdoo. And the story about McAdoo signing, and, and Milt, you pro probably remember the details more than I do, but uh, was was pretty amazing simply because McAdoo had signed with the ABA as a minor and and there was all sorts of intrigue. Remember that one? I remember it in uh... – I had trouble following that story. The Carter was beating me on that story. Jim Baker, Jim Baker went out to the job with that. And Baker went out to the uh, Hum Hotel near the airport. <laughs> he was sneaking around here trying to. They had a secret meeting between McAdoo and his agent and, and Eddie Donovan. They're trying to trying to avoid um, trying to avoid the Baker. And I think he was sneaking around the. Well, I think he almost got arrested by security there, but it was. Uh, <laughs> He, he he was in on the bottom of that story. It was such a straight. It was a, it was a it was just a bad it was just a bad story. It was and I don't. Um, Earl Foreman was the owner of the um, Virginian the Virginians who had supposedly yeah. allegedly signed him. Right. To it. And Baker went uh, found out where they were meeting at the hotel. We've got a big section of this in Buffalo, home of the Braves, and went up and knocked on the door. And uh, I believe uh, Donovan opened up and he said, I hear Bob McAdoo's here. And he said, no, he's not here. You're crazy. Get out of here. And then they went back downstairs and Jim had a photographer with him too. And, and they look looking up at the floor and they see another light light up in the room like next to it. So it's got to be a suite. So they go back up and now Baker knocks on the other door who opens up the door, 
Bob McAdoo. <laughs> <laughs> and Donovan appears behind McAdoo and just kind of looks at Baker and goes, <laughs> and closes the door. <laughs> but that contract's interesting because that contract's kind of like one of those Al Capone things because it seems pretty apparent McAdoo signed and it seems like Snyder sent somebody down to get the contract and just put it away in a safety deposit box somewhere and have it be forgotten forever. The, the story I heard, Tim, was I think it was from Foreman who said once Snyder paid Foreman to release all rights to McAdoo, the contract was torn up and flushed down the, ho the toilet hotel. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, well, that's doing business. Yeah. And McAdoo comes in, and, and the Braves already have Bob Kaufman, who we, sh we should mention uh, in, in passing. And, and uh, they've already got Elmore Smith. And McAdoo, really, at 6'11", wasn't really cast to be a small forward. It, just, it was an odd mix of players that they had there. Yeah. I mean, McAdoo was getting eaten up by, what, the Lou Hudson's and Apple the Havlicek's of the world, and he couldn't, couldn't cover it. And I think this is where, you know, I give um, – the team some credit is they made some room for McAdoo to be the center and uh, may some of it was desperation, but. Well, they didn't do it. They didn't do it. So Elmore was limping around the end of the year. They went to San Antonio for two games against the Rockets and they had to play him at center. And he, he averaged about 35 points a game. He gets a pretty good Houston team. And that was it. That, 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 the die was cast for the next year. They, they traded Elmore to the Lakers and, uh, and uh, McAdoo became the center and he was just, too good an athlete to, 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 for most of those NBA centers to deal with, the Bore Winkles and people like that. And you know, he was, it was kind of forced on him. But, you know, it's funny, um, we are talking about Hummer before. I, I, lately, I've been looking at some old newspapers, clippings around the early 70s. And I, I've only caused box, you, you could be in, looking at the Spokane, Washington paper, and there's the NBA box scores. And so I look at the box to see. Yeah, I, saw, I even found a game where Hummer scored 22 points against the Lakers in L.A. I can't – I don't remember that, but it's there. Right? Donnie May uh, led the team, I think, with 24 that day. Or something. But Hummer had a few good games, but then, then he started to break down physically, and he, and he got – I think he got demoralized too because uh, – and then I think teams teams caught up and realized he couldn't shoot and they could follow him, and he, he was not a, very confident at the foul line. No, he, yeah, he, okay, and he, um, but he's a, he's a, I think he's a billionaire now or something in, in out, in, out in San Francisco. And um, the Braves, I hear from him once in a while. The Braves also add uh, Ernie DiGregorio, and it's hard to express just how exciting Ernie D was coming out of college. I mean, everybody was talking about him. He was this six foot guard out of Providence who was just a wizard with a basketball and the Braves signed him. And I, I was part of the crowd at the odd for a rookie scrimmage. And I think they had like 11, 12,000, which was bigger than most of their attendance for regular season games during the course of the year. But he was the guy. Um, well, it was he against Doug Collins, the two rookies, fines. Yep. And then they played the next night. They played in uh, Cherry Hill, Cherry Hill, um, New Jersey because they couldn't get a big gym in uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> they played. They played, and I, I, well, I remember it was a torrential rainstorm while we were in, inside the. Um, I think it was for the uh, Jer New Jersey hockey Eastern Hockey League team played in. But I'll tell you what, I mean, forgot. I, I forgot till recently. Looked at the box score, opening game at Boston Garden the next season. Ernie had I think thirty four points or something against Boston, in Boston, and Buffalo lost. I think Buffalo won the game, I think, too, which they had just beat. They had, I think it was the first game they ever won in Boston Garden. They had beaten, the, beaten them the year before, but they beaten them in Providence in Buffalo, but they had never beaten them in the Boston Garden until the opener, 74-75 season. They already had a sensational game. I almost forgotten all about it. it was like, well, you kind of wonder what kind of career Ernie would have had if he hadn't hurt his knee, and especially if he hadn't hurt his knee on the West Coast and, yeah. and he gotten the treatment he needed. It's funny. I mean, one of the guys we talked with, among others, for Buffalo and the Braves, Jim McMillan, and once Ernie got hurt, and then, you know, subsequently down the road left the team, McMillan would go spot up in the far corner, and DiGregorio would find them all the time. Long cross-court pass. 
and then do a couple games and McMillan setting up, waiting for the pass, and he realizes I'm not getting that pass anymore. The guy who throws it is pretty pretty hurt. So it's uh it's another what if you kind of throw in with the Braves history. Well, that's 73-74 team, which uh, let's see here, program, program, program. That's right. Get your programs here. Playoffs. They got better as the season went along. Gar Hurd came in, and they were almost like reinventing basketball to some extent because they were all just guys, Randy Smith, Ernie D, they just loved to get up and down the court. And they got better and better at it. And they were sure hard to outscore. Uh, well, it took a while. It took until January where they finally hit stride. They had a, they had a West Coast triple. They won in Portland and Seattle. But Ernie had the 25 assists in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used to, uh, a lot of the New York media used to uh, question the, the Braves' stats uh, when – Especially one day when Ernie had more assists than the team had field goals. But <laughs> Rudy, Rudy Marsky wanted to determine to make him rookie of the year. But he, he had 25 assists in Portland by their scoring system, so their score. So he, uh, and then they, then they had a, a game down at the at Cole Fieldhouse in uh, College Park. They played the Bullets, and they just, they just ran the Bullets off the floor that night. And then later on, they finally won a game in game in Madison Square Garden, which they had never done either. And uh, that's when the team really blossomed in January of that year. They, and they were a little up and down early in the season. Good, sensational at times. Um, I remember I went, the first year we went on a, a preseason tour. The first game was against the Celtics in, uh, in uh, Augusta, Maine. And the Celtics won the game. Next night, the Celtics, they, both teams went down to the Garden to play the first game of the doubleheader. And the Braves blew them out. Uh, and they amazed, they amazed the Garden crowd. The Knicks played, I think, the Phoenix Suns in the next game. And uh, that was the indication of what was to come because they really started they really started to come together. And the design of the team, and Jack Ramsey and, uh, and, and Eddie, the pieces started to work work together. Kids, if you're, if you're wondering, the NBA was, was small time back then. Remember that Milt just said they played an exhibition game in Augusta, Maine. You know, is the main Hall of Fame, Jim. Well, you know, I, 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 have, a, I have a look at the roster of the NBA front office. I knew everybody that worked in the NBA front office. Now, it, now it's like 2,000 people. In, yeah. And then they have another branch in, in London and another branch in Hong Kong or someplace. It's That's amazing how much it leaves. 74 playoff series, one of my favorites. I even played hooky from Syracuse and came back for game four on, on a uh, Saturday afternoon. I think I was in the last row of section 36, if you remember the odd. But uh, Tim, just back and forth, great basketball. And the Celtics were the future NBA champions. And, and the Braves certainly gave them all they could handle. Oh, very much so. And I think you were absolutely right, bud. What we're starting to see is the evolution of the game. Some of the conversations I had with Dr. Jack and putting together the book, you know, he pointed out what the NBA became, you know, running the floor, everybody able to shoot, everybody able to score, really was the Braves back in that time. And uh, you look at, you know, certainly the teams today, you know, just getting out of the bubble and playing there with, you know, LeBron and the Lakers, but even going back to Nash and the Phoenix Suns, et cetera, that's kind of Braves basketball. They may not be able to stop a lot of people, but they could outscore a lot of people. Unfortunately, they kept running into teams like the Celtics and uh, <laughs> couldn't get past them. Milt, did you get a good look at Daryl Garrett's foul call on McAdoo against Jojo White in game six? Yeah, it happened about, if I recall, it happened about eight feet from where I was sitting. That was a foul. It was, it was a broken play on a last – on a game-ending play, it was the reason the ball went out to out to uh, went out to JoJo was Mackett, who had blocked, had come across the top of the circle and and, and blocked the shot by Havlicek, I believe. Fouled the ball went out to JoJo and fought, it was a broken play. The ball, the, the, the play was set up for Havlicek, which he destroyed, and the ball went out to JoJo and he let it up and Mackett just went and he, and he he didn't hack him on the arm. He just kind of got him uh, across the his leg crossed his leg. Probably a foul, but boy, it, it, it was. The thing was, I, I the thing that bothered me most, it was uh, it left the fan, Buffalo fans, who finally had uh, basketball fans, or something to root for that year. It was an exciting team, most exciting team in the league, probably. And the season ends on a, uh, was a, on a tie game, and the opponents 
good player standing on the line shooting free throws and and the and the, an outstanding series. You know, yeah, Jim McMillan won a game with a rebound basket. Braves led the cup, led first opener in Boston. Had a comfortable lead, but couldn't hold on. Kind of wore out. And um, that was a good good Boston team, and they had. Uh, uh, they were a very good home court team in Boston. It was almost impossible to beat them up there. Yeah. It's funny, it's but uh, in talking with Ramsey, he begrudgingly admitted it was probably a foul, but what he wanted was some time still left on the clock. Yeah. You know, the yeah, way yeah, McAdoo was shooting, you know, at least, as Milt's saying, don't have it end with a guy standing at a free throw uh, with time has run out. I mean, that's, that's kind that's of false. Yeah. Well, they had some problems with Garrison because – before that, when they they had a, they finished the season with a um, trip to the West Coast, and on the way up, they played a game in Detroit on a Sunday afternoon, and Garrison Ramsey got thrown out of the game by Garrison. Now Jack used to Jack used to get heated, me, and I, I I he annoyed officials once in a while because his knowledge of the rules and uh, <laughs> and and he was on top of the game all the way around, but Garrison tossed him out <laughs> in Detroit, and and I think there was some bad blood. Uh, Bad blood carried over from that. I, I think also, Bud, the bad blood continues. I believe this is the night where Snyder follows the refs, you know, it, to you know, to their dressing room and is pounding on the door. So, yeah. which actually, it's funny in talking to the old Braves, almost all of them brought that up. That was on, <laughs> they were on the team that year. They're going, yeah, I don't know. Times I wasn't sure about our owner, but I do remember that time he kind of tried to hunt down the refs and beat on their door for a while. They got a big kick out of that. Now, Milt, the next year, the Braves start off even better, uh, even though Ernie D gets hurt fairly early in the season. I think it was October 29th or something. Well, Ernie got hurt, and Gar, Gar got hurt, and Jim McMillan had appendicitis, had appendix, as appendix now. Mm -hmm. Now, I did get one question that maybe you, you're qualified to answer, Milt, which was the Ernie No D nickname. Was Ernie D that much of a defensive liability before the injury? Because clearly the knee injury, I think, slowed him down. Well, I think also uh, the other the other guys the other guys are pretty smart too, and you know some of these quicker guys realize that they could beat him off the dribble or get to their spot on the floor. Um, and Ernie was an offensive-minded player too. Don't forget he was you know his fun in the game was shooting, making free throws, and making great passes and seeing the floor. That's where that's where his most enjoyment in basketball I think came. I don't think he I don't think he enjoyed st making a steal and. <laughs> Like from mid court, and like like Randy used to do once in a while. I you know that was where the emphasis of his game was, and I but I think that slowed him up a little bit. I think also he his body was not he didn't have a lean body. He was a ch chunky little kid, you know, and he, it was tough to stay lean and stay quick when you when you're like that. But um, I still I once in a while maybe once a year I get to talk to Ernie. He comes to town occasionally and. Uh, we get together for a cup of coffee or something. It was funny when he left town. We weren't on good terms, but he, I, we're, we're, he's, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of friends now. And another guy, McAdoo is, um, McAdoo when he comes to town, I get a chance to talk to him once in a while. Now the Braves yeah. lose Ernie Dean. Kenny Charles moves into the lineup, and they actually don't miss that much of a beat. They still win forty nine games. And as Tim referenced earlier, who do they run into? The Washington Bullets, who we all thought was going to, were going to win the NBA championship that year. I still don't believe Golden State swept them in four in the finals, but the Bullets were really loaded then. And it took them to seven games. Yeah, it took them to seven games, and it, uh, it was a strange seventh game when Mendy Rudolph has a heart attack, which basically on the floor, which basically drives him out of out of the game. Uh, out of the game permanently after that. And that was kind of a upsetting uh, situation on the road in the game seven against Elvin Hayes, Melvin Unseld, um, Kevin Porter, um, some pretty good, they had some guys coming up, Nick Weatherspoon coming off the bench, people like that. And I think Joe Chenier was with that team, wasn't he? Yeah, yep. Reardon, Chenier. So it's, yeah. uh, they had a lot of firepower and unfortunately, you know, but as you well know, a, a, a tough matchup problem with Unseld and, and Hayes. That's kind of like the Sabres when in the late 70s when they were good. <laughs> they weren't going to win the Stanley Cup with the Canadians in that era. Sometimes you got to be the right place at the right time and, and get a couple breaks here and there. 
76, another good year, and the Braves actually won a playoff series um, at the end of it. And maybe the one of the great moments was uh, Bob McAdoo hitting two free throws right at the end of regulation time and the third and deciding game with Philadelphia while the basket was moving. Uh, <laughs> oh, was moving. The fans were shaking the guide wires to it. And uh, so Bob had a moving target and he still made it. That's pretty clutch. <laughs> uh, and then they go and play the Celtics again, who again went on to win the NBA championship. And, and Ernie D had a little revival there where he was – came off the bench and, and got them the two wins in uh, games three and four and even the series. But uh, that was kind of the, the last high point for Ernie as a Brave. Charlie Scott, I heard him. Man. Charlie Scott was a good player. Uh, hadn't really done a lot in Boston, but he had a couple of big games in that series, including game six, I believe. It's, well. and that was not as good a Braves team as the team before. Had maybe a little more depth, but um, – that 73-74 team was really fun because it just – it the team just blossomed and all of a sudden after going through three years of uh, 20, 22, 21 wins, complaining about the officials and getting lit up by uh, all those different guys that came in and lit us up, um, especially the West Coast team. So, it seemed like they hit – when, when uh, New York and Boston came to town, Braves played some great games. They were, they were probably the most exciting moments uh, – at the odd in those years, even though they seldom won. And there was some great, you know, uh, Tommy Heinsohn comes to town. He was a, he was actually a Tommy. Tommy's a good guy. I didn't realize this. I just found a story recently with Tommy Heinsohn when he came to the odd when he was in college at Holy Cross, played at Niagara, and he, they got into a beef. They got into a beef on the court. It was a somebody fight, you know. Uh, Heinsohn, so don't Heinsohn, that's the kid, the German kid from Union City, New Jersey. <laughs> um, tough guy and a good, a good guy, just a good guy who's still around. I don't think he's doing any more broadcasting, though, in Boston. Now, Tim, somebody asked me who the key player on the Braves were during that three-year stretch when they were a playoff team, and besides McAdoo, of course. And it, the thing that strikes me was it was almost a revolving cast. Some nights it was Smith or Ernie D was more early. McMillan and Hurd and eventually Shoemate all hit, all came in. I don't know if there was a, a second banana, if you will. Randy kind of grew into that role, especially later after McAdoo left. Uh, no, Randy had some huge clutch performances for a guy who, a guy from a little town on Long Island who played small college ball and was just kind of having a lot of fun. He was a soccer player. Really, I think down deep he wanted to be a center fielder and a, they say he was he would have been a great center fielder in baseball, and he liked, and he could. He was a natural in track and field, and um, but he loved soccer and he played basketball. He played like he enjoyed it. <laughs> I, nothing seemed to phase him, you know. Although it did, he was. It was really it was a sad day when, when we lost Randy so suddenly the way we did. I've never seen an NBA player get better, faster than Randy did when he from the time he first got here as a small forward to the NBA All-Star MVP in 78, the, the growth curve was just so dramatic with him. Well, he worked on his shooting. He became a shooter. I mean, he was not a very good shooter when he came in. He was just a great athlete, super athlete. Yeah, he could run all day, and, and Milt's right. He worked on his shooting. He figured out early on that uh, he was releasing the ball, he told me, on the way down. And he said, hmm, that doesn't quite add up. Maybe that's a soccer thing, but in basketball, I got to do it at the top. And um, and I think some way, you know, but you were just talking about how there wasn't a second banana, so to speak. I think a lot of this was the coaching. You know, I, I think Dr. Jack get, should get a lot of credit because one of the first things he says when he comes to town was, uh, oh, I believe in, you know, defense, especially in the center spot. He was in love with Elmore Smith. Oh, this is what we need to grow. But then he saw, you know, in a sense, the potential with McAdoo when he got in there and he changed. And it's not... I don't think a lot of coaches will change their philosophy that much to suit the talent, but Dr. Jack did. Ironically, you know, he ends up in Portland and ends up with a great center and wins a championship with it. Well, I look, I just, I'm just looking at one of my uh, books here with my phone list, and I have a phone number for Jack Ramsey in Lake, uh, Lake Oswego, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. In case anybody wanted to call me, I also have John White Brown's number at the like, Club International in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> well, here's the 76 playoff program, the last one the Braves had at home, and, and immediately problems started. Jack Ramsey leaves in the summer of 76. The Braves are almost sold and moved to Miami. Mm -hmm. And you just got the feeling that things weren't going to work out here after all. After the last three years, there was kind of some – some good times, but it was like it was almost a throwback to the early days when things weren't uh, settled. And then, of course, December 19, 1976, McAdoo gets traded for the Knicks to the Knicks for cash and John Gianelli. And uh, I don't know if that was this, you could start writing the obituary, but you could certainly start thinking about leads. Uh, Milt, was that as uh, confusing well, and all the time to that, be around the team? That that followed the Jim McMillan deal, which was not even disguised. That was an outright cash deal. Right. Uh, Jim McMillan. Um, but, you know, that, man, I don't think that sh if I was if I was a potential ticket buyer, I don't think that would attract me to see him sell the best player, to get trade away the best player. And so it's a division, right? We taking all those years where, where, the, where the Braves are going past the Knicks as, as far as a good, being a good team. And, um, uh, and all of a sudden, you give him your best player, you trade him your best player. It didn't make any sense to the fans, but you could see the handwriting's on the wall. And my 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 impression of what was done in those deals was John Y. Brown, and I've been told this, John Y. Brown was a wealthy man, but he was not, his, his wealth was not very liquid. He had a lot of money, he had money tied up in bonds, federal bonds and stuff, things that aren't liquid. And when he wanted to buy a team from Snyder, to buy the cash for the deal, he allowed allowed him to sell off those two talented players, and that was the transaction was basically the cash that came in from those two deals, and then allowed him to buy Snyder out, and, and then when he needed money later on to pay a huge bonus that Hummer of all people was owed, he brought in Harry Mangurian, who, who was. Well, I understand was five times at five times the net worth of, of John Y. Brown. John Y. Brown's fame, chicken, Chucky Fried Chicken fame. Harry Mangurian, has a furniture deal in Rochester, was much more wealthier and and much more uh, had more, much more available cash. And uh, Mangurian uh, held, stayed with the team until uh, the Boston years, and then he then he cashed out and went back to horse racing, which he was which he made a lot of money at. Mm -hmm. But I tend to look at a moment just a little bit before then, and actually it was McAdoo who reminded me of it when we have Moses Malone for a couple games. Yep. And uh, Moses gets in two games, plays like a total of about three minutes. And, and McAdoo's the one who pointed this out to me. He said, you know, they always said I wanted to play center. But for Moses, I would have moved over to strong forward. And, and he's, he actually sent me a, an email after we talked at one point with the ages that they were at this time. And McAdoo's 25, Malone's 21, and there's a guy named Dantley who's 21. And you're going, and then he wrote in the message, hmm, forward line like that, hmm, I think we make a couple runs at some titles. Yeah, so, John Schumate was around then. And, yes. Uh, if, if he could figure out how to do the playing time and all that, you know, and even Bob McKinnon, the general managers kind of looked back and said, yeah, we kind of blew that one. Yeah. Blew it big well, time. The, guy, the guy that threw the monkey wrench in that was Tate Slock. Tate Slock did not, he didn't want to, I don't think, Tate Slock, I did not like Moses Malone anyway, but I think because he tried to recruit him for Clemson and he was unsuccessful. And, um, and, I don't think he wanted to. I, I think if, if Tate Slock said I want to keep this guy, they would have kept him, or they would have they would have made some other move, um, but they didn't. And I, I think Tate Slock screwed up that whole thing. Yeah, if you, yeah, that's we're unfortunate. We're going to be told who to play. You know, they they got him from they got him in the dispersal of the ABA dispersal draft. Mm -hmm. well, Portland got him, and then Portland didn't need him because they had they had a, a guy named Walton. So they didn't need they didn't need Moses. And and I I think that's what happened there. I don't think I don't think they would have traded him if um, if Tate had put his foot down and said I want the guy. We have to do something else. Yeah, but, it's really too bad because you know we see the numbers that Malone puts up pretty quickly. You know, averaging thirteen boards a game, fifteen, seventeen, and uh, one of the best. Right. 
So and John Y. buys the team in the uh, spring of 77 and, and starts revamping it over the summer. Brings in Cotton Fitzsimmons and then Tiny Archibald and uh, Billy Knight. And the luck for the Braves was pretty typical as Archibald plays his first exhibition game and tears his Achilles and is out for the season in about the second quarter and, or whatever time it was in the game. But with it, it was almost like, well, that season's over. Will we ever get another one? Well, it, it, they didn't really have a – they didn't have another guard, you know. Mm -hmm. That would have been, been an interesting year, him and Randy in the same backcourt. <laughs> um, yeah. But, they, but the rest of their guards were uh, more or less journeyman type. Uh, Teddy McLean, uh, Chucky Williams, people like that. Uh, but – Tiny used to, he used to, they would have got also, Tiny used to drive the Braves nuts. He used to score a million against them. <laughs> I bet he, he averaged 40 against them one couple of years there with Kansas City, Omaha, and Cincinnati. Not like Dick Snyder and John McLaughlin, though. <laughs> Every time I looked up, they'd go off for 34 against the Braves. <laughs> I still remember the night, Randy, I think it was Randy, took the ball out of bounds. They had a one point lead on Seattle and he was, throws the ball inbounds. And he throws it right to Freddie Downtown Brown, who had just made about six in a row from 30 feet. And, and Downtown Brown missed it. Forcey, then about, about a week later, I think Randy stole the ball from Paul Westfall in midcourt, losing the game and won the game. When, now the Braves they, made one other deal in 77, 78. And I read a biography of Marvin Barnes <laughs> that said the Braves were probably the only, apparently the only team in the NBA that didn't know Marvin had a cocaine problem, <laughs> which do your homework kids. It, it can pay off, but Milt, uh, how'd you like Marvin during his time here? I never had much to do with him, but I, I, I only remember one time I was in, um, the game was in Atlanta and after the, we stayed at, the, at a Marriott hotel, not the, an old Marriott down on, and, and, Everybody, it was a coffee, famous Marriott coffee shop. Everybody went there when the bars closed at two, one or two in the morning. So I'm going to the, sitting at the counter and I'm having a coffee and a, and a breakfast. And now comes Marvin. Marvin had his entourage. He had all these people that followed him around. Yeah, I mean, I, I made 10 to 12, 10 to 20 people that followed him around. And he came, <laughs> not only did he have to collect a, like a, 20 breakfasts, the cart, he paid for it and brought it up to his, to his room, to his guests. I said, what a good guy, you know, but I, I, I never had, I never had many direct dealings with Marvin and uh, he was, uh, I remember he had, I remember when I went in New Orleans, he disappeared. I think he either, he got suspended or he just, he just disappeared. And it was the night that, the uh, New Orleans Jazz were going to make the playoffs. They had Truck Robinson, they had Pete Maravich, and they were on a roll. And and about half, like, I was sitting at courtside at the Superdome. Maravich comes down the court, plants his foot, and throws a between the legs bounce pass half court to Truck Robinson for a layup. And then he plants his right foot down and he blows his knee out. And they, the Jazz, I think they, I don't know, they, they might not have made the playoffs, so they lost in the first round. And they were they were going to, on the way to winning uh, fifty or sixty games that year. And just being a hot dog, he he tore, he wrecked his knee, and it bothered him the rest of his career. Remember, he had the when he played for the Celtics, he had the the big um, knee brace on all the time. Bud Van Miller tells a great story about Marvin Barnes, where you know he hasn't really officially joined the team yet. Braves are having practice somewhere. Maybe it was ECC, I don't know, and um, and. Everybody's figuring Marvin's going to be there. No Marvin yet. About a half hour into practice, Marvin shows up with the entourage that Milt just described, maybe not 12 deep, but certainly about six deep, and uh, comes in wearing like a fur coat, that type of thing. And, and Bad remembers, took off the fur coat, had, you know, basketball duds on underneath and said, let's play ball. <laughs> It was probably jealous being in his own fur coat. <laughs> Raccoon coat used it. Yeah. Now, the Braves played their last game in Boston in uh, April. In fact, uh, let's see here. This is the, from their last home game the night before the program. Um, and it was the last game for John Havlicek, the last game for 
for Ernie D and the last game for Dave Bing, all with Boston. And it was mm -hmm. the last game for the Braves in Buffalo. So now uh, wrapping up before we get to Q&A, uh, a, a few of the basic questions overall. Uh, all things considered, did the Braves ever have a chance in Buffalo want to stay long term? Uh, is the area just too small to support two winter sports franchises in this day and age? Could they have made it even if things had gone better for them? It would have been difficult. Yeah, you know, I opened my eyes once. I this was in the nineties. I went to. I was at. A, I was going into Boston, and I ran to a guy at the airport named Harry. Um, Oh, a guy who worked for the Braves. He worked for the Detroit Pistons. He produced their television telecast. And I see him. He's on, he's on his way. To, he was visiting his mother who lived in the southern tier. He says, he says, hey, I got a, you want a ticket for the game tonight? We're playing the Celtics in Boston. I said, yeah, go to the game and show up and pick up the cop tickets. Very they were and they were not the best tickets in the house. For $45 each, I go, I can't see Buffalo fans paying $45 to see a pro basketball game. And these were... And it was like sitting down the end, looking down the end line from the side. You know, it was not like you're sitting at a court side like like we used to but behind the team bench. And I said, I, I said, this would be a tough ticket in Buffalo to, buy, to sell, especially when the, if the Sabres are doing anything. And then the Bills, and then when the Bills were selling tickets again because they got good in the early '90s, right? So I don't, I don't know. It would have been, it would have been tough. Would have had, he would have had a, would have had a um, owner that would. As, as, as she said, you had somebody who was very patient to let the market develop and, and go through the uh, go through the down years as far as as far as gave me seats and, and television ratings and stuff like that. Right. Tim, the one patient, one caveat patient. might be if the Braves hang on until Magic and Larry Bird arrive in the fall. Exactly. Like the new the new dawn life. of the NBA is coming, and they just had to hang on, and maybe they had to be more regional. I know it irritated folks in Buffalo to be playing games in Toronto, but I got to throw Snyder a little bit of a bone because he was stumbling upon some kind of regional sports thing there that maybe could have kept them going. So, uh, but I think, Bud, you're absolutely right. Here comes Magic. Here comes Bird. Here comes the new NBA with a lot more money, and Milt's absolutely right. Needed a little bit more patience. There never was enough well, patience with this. Team. Also, a little, a little, a little savvy in your scheduling. Mm -hmm. They never made good use of Sunday afternoon. They always complained about Sabres. But Boston, Boston played Sunday afternoon for years and changed over for the Bruins that night. They did it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in fact, I was looking at this first year NBA guide and I saw the starting times for the games and I saw. Starting times of Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. I, I can't remember them playing Sunday afternoon. They did. They played two games in, in the whole season on Sunday afternoon. One was against Portland. because they, The NBA didn't do any favors either. They, you know, the first year, they played Boston four times. Once in Philadelphia, once in Boston, tw and twice here. They played the Knicks four times, same thing. They had to play Portland and Cleveland 12 times each. Now, who who want to watch the Portland Trailblazers of that year? 12 times in this year. They played them in Rochester. They played, they played them, they played them all over the place. They, they if they could have played in, in, it's like saying, well, if we, if we played in a, in a division with the Yankees we, or the Red Sox, we'd be, we'd make it a hit success too. But they, they the league did them no favors uh, schedule wise. And they did themselves no favors by uh, complaining all the time about not having Saturday night in December and January and February. And, and making the best of what was of what was left. Friday nights were great, and even though Snyder used to complain that he, the high school games were taking taking fans away from the Braves, um, the Sunday afternoon would have been would have been great. It was a couple of times they did in the last year or so it was a great family day. They were trying to appeal to appeal to families, and the tickets were modest enough. Prices were modest enough, but you could afford to take your family to a game. I see people going to. I see crowds at the Sabres games now, and I, I see people sitting with three or four kids and I, at the price of those tickets. I go, how can you afford? How can you afford to go to a hockey game, yeah. have seen the tickets, and and bring your three or five year old kid? You know, for what? How much the tickets are? I don't know. Ninety. I haven't bought a ticket to a game in so long. I don't know what they cost now, but it depends where you sit, of course. Um, and finally. Um, I don't know about you guys. I don't follow the NBA nearly as close. It took a long time for it was kind of like a down a, down a hill in terms of interest once the Braves left. 
And partly I don't really like the style of the play with a three, three point play, the dribble drive, go to the layup, dish it out for a three pointer. But I, I have a lot of trouble getting as excited as the NBA. And I mean, I played basketball, I was 52 and, and followed the game closely, but um, I'm not sure I like it as much as I used, certainly as much as I used to and follow it. Uh, I was wondering how you guys felt. Tim, well, I, I never told, I got, until I got involved while following one team, game after game after game, you kind of get wrapped up in that. But I agree with you. I don't like the style of ball they play. And I'm, it really doesn't interest me. No, I'm, I'm always in the 50s, I used to watch it all the time on what well, was on TV. And I grew up in the New Haven area. They used to play two or three double headers a year, a season, and in, in, um, at the New Haven Arena because um, the NBA commissioner was was Maurice Podolop and his brother owned the New Haven Arena, so we gave him a couple of dates. I remember, I, went, I went. I saw Frank Selby play for the Milwaukee Hawks there. I saw. I saw the. I've seen the Bulls. I saw the Philadelphia Warriors in the fifties play there, and. Um, and they, they played a lot of games in Buffalo in those years, too. You know, Rochester played here. Some of Syracuse played some games here right. at the yeah. odd. But I don't really watch it that much anymore. And I think part of it is I can, you know, dial up the TV and or do Sirius XM, listen to my friend Pete Weber, who was gracious enough to read the foreword for the audio book for Buffalo Home of the Braves. I couldn't ratchet up and do Van Miller credibly. Pete did. <laughs> So I've got all these choices. I could go, I could watch some NBA game I don't really know a lot about, or I could listen to Pete, you know, or, you know, dial something else up. I think we've got so many more choices that I think we tend to mainline particular sports now a little bit more than we used to. Well, Pete uh, has the first question to throw out for us. And uh, he says, was Randy the fastest with the ball that you've ever seen? Milt, I'll let you handle it. <laughs> Uh, I guess he is. I, I I never really thought of it, but I I, I can't think of anybody that, that was faster. Um, some guys may be a little niftier at full speed. Andy had had more moves than Randy, but Randy Randy straight on to the basket. Not 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 a real fancy Dan. He could dunk, he could dunk the ball, but you know that wasn't a lot of behind the back stuff with him or reverse spins and stuff. He could, he didn't because he didn't reach so he usually ran, ran away from the defense. Now, I might be flashing on the wrong guy. Was Joe Caldwell? Was he fast? Doug Collins telling me one time that jumper. Well, uh, jumper. I don't know. It was some, um, some other guy who was really fast, and Collins told me I'd I'd pay good money to see a race between whoever this guy is. I can't remember and Randy. So um, I, I remember he he was he played in the Queen City tournament when I mean, he was at Arizona State, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I heard stories about him leaping over a, a, a player from the other team. I don't know if it was Canisius or the other other team that came in, leaping over a guy and and, and dunking the ball. Dunks were allowed in, the, in those until um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar came along right. at UCLA. Then they outlawed the dunk for for quite a while. Was outlawed. All right, we got a a two-parter here. What do you think is the chance of the NBA ever returning to Buffalo? I'd say slim and none. And are you crazy? And slim is left. <laughs> yeah, slim and none. And I think part of it is they didn't fight for it when it left, you know? And I, well, and, you know, maybe the, certainly the numbers may weren't there. May you got to do some kind of regional thing. But if you let somebody just kind of leave and take your lunch, um, I don't know. It's going to be tough again. But well, like when Cleveland Mark also won. asks, uh, given what happened with the Blue Jays this summer, do you think there's a possibility the Raptors will play in Buffalo as the home court for the upcoming NBA season? <laughs> and and the way the virus is gone and borders thing, there's just no way of telling. But if you had told me a year ago the Blue Jays would be playing home games in Buffalo, I would have said you're you're crazy. And now – Anything's possible, I think, looking forward. I have no idea what the NBA and the NHL are going to look like in, in uh, the winter. And, boy, with border problems, the Raptors may be in the same situation. All right. All right. Good point. Of course, with, I, they're talking about an all-Canadian conference for the uh, NHL next season, so nobody has to leave across the border if it comes to that next year. So it's obviously quite a mess. Um any possibility? Jack Marin, a great shooter or just pretty good? Asked John Murphy. 
<laughs> I think he was a great shooter. And one of the things, Murph, that Jack Marin, the man bomber, pointed out to me when I was talking with him, he loved it, and it was difficult for him to describe it. He loved the lighting. He loved the angles and the old odd. He, he just, you know, and he was maybe a little, you know, disconsolate when he, when he ended up in Buffalo. And he still remember, he'd tell me about walking into the odd the first time and just kind of shooting a bit and going, oh, I can't miss here. This is going to be okay. I like this place. So I don't know. Nobody got hotter than hot. I, I loved seeing him shoot, and I was up in the cheap seats then. <laughs> well, the way he was used, he was coming off the bench and um, to get a run going and need a need some relief from the starters and, he, and he, the other team would relax and he'd come along, come around that pick and make come right. around to his left side and um, and nail a couple of those and he he, he shot daggers. He was a dagger shooter, you know. You're up you're up trying to put a four point lead and he 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 gets the basket that makes it a six point lead. And, it, and that was before the three-point shot, too. Right, right. Uh, but Jack, good guy, good lawyer, I guess. Mm -hmm. Very good lawyer. Tom asks, uh, do, you, do any of you know if any old Braves games are available on videotape from some of the 70s teams? Now, I think there's a game on uh, – a few games on YouTube, right? Uh, a couple of the playoffs games and maybe the Braves. Right. I know the Braves-Cavaliers game on Christmas Day, their last yeah, that, year, has popped I've up on the that. NBA Network. Yeah. Right, and and McAdoo making what fifty five or sixty whatever he hit that one big game fifty I believe you can find that on YouTube too. But, um, yeah, yeah, it was you know what the, the telecasts were not as prevalent as they are now, and the national telecasts were 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 rare, at least as far as the Braves were. So, but I've seen some of the, I watched some of the games in um, that Cleveland that Cleveland game. I enjoyed enjoyed watching that game Christmas Day. And um, I remember flying down to Cleveland in the morning, going to the game, and come flying back in the afternoon. It was like amazing. I never, never did that. I mean, probably the first time I spent Christmas away from home, away from family. I remember it well. Hmm. Well, I think we've, uh, I'm checking the questions, and I think we've uh, covered the ones we've had. So I think we're done for the night, gentlemen. Uh, it has been. A real treat to go back and review this team. It's uh, the Braves were never boring, were they? It was just one oh. thing after another for eight years. Yeah, it was great. It was great. Ed, Ed Rush was the made the last big bad call against Buffalo. Ah, all right. <laughs> Ed T. Not Ed, Ed, I don't. I don't just mean Ed Rush and Ed T. Rush was around, uh, but. Um, oh, and Pete, Pete Weber asked us not to forget Don Adams. Don Adams. Any yes. discussion of, of Braves talk. Uh, and Bud, thank you for doing a great job. Milt, great seeing you again. If I can put a little bit of a plug in, Buffalo Home of the Braves is out in the coffee table. You can find that on Amazon, coffee table thing. It's also out now in Audible, audio, audio book. Thanks to Pete Weber, reading Van Miller's Forward, and we're also up on Kindle. So the Braves live on. Don started a fight with Kermit Washington. Hmm. That's a Pete Weber <laughs> says. Don Adams. Don Adams. I'll throw in a quick plug for the History Museum again. If you haven't yes. been to the Icons Museum and you're a sports fan in Buffalo, what are you waiting for? It's really a terrific uh, area that's set up over the long term with all sorts of uniforms and memorabilia. And right now it is free. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. So um, be sure to drop by if you're ever in the area. So, and, guys, thanks so much. I think we're done. And uh, and thanks, thanks to Matt, on, too. Everybody. Thanks to Matt for setting this up. Yep. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Enjoyed it a lot. Uh, thank you. Have a good night. Good night.